And you did that, right? Yes, you did, because I can hear myself. Great. Oh, I'm so pleased to be here this afternoon. This is delightful. This is one of the things I missed the most last year was not having in-person events with our faculty presenting and uh, various external speakers. Um, my name is Darlene Farby and I am the chair of the English department here at USD. And I am delighted to welcome you to the first of our fall English department colloquium events. And I would like to remind you before we get started that on Monday, October 18th, from 3.30 to 5, so a little bit longer than usual, um, 3.30 to 5, we will be having a virtual event with visiting writer um, Jan Beatty, who is an author, a poet. She's the director of creative writing at Carlo University in Pittsburgh. And she's going to be giving a reading and craft talk, which is one of the reasons that we, we actually scheduled this for a little bit longer space. Um, and we are looking forward to welcoming her virtually, despite all of my extolling of the virtues of being here in person today. Um, <clears throat> so, and then coming up after that, we have a reading here in Farber Hall on the 25th of October on Monday afternoon. Um, Pete Dexter, our writer in residence, will be reading from some of his current work. And uh, we have two more events after that. Michael Spiegel, who is a PhD student and our current Wolf Scholar will be presenting and Leanne Rohrpa will be doing a uh, reading and craft talk for us. Um, and those are, those are both in November. So nice set of events for us all this fall. So it's my pleasure to be introducing Dr. Benjamin Hagen, who is an associate professor um, recently tenured. And uh, Benjamin Hagen is the editor of Wolf Studies Annual and the author of The Sensuous Pedagogies of Virginia Woolf and B.H. Lawrence from Clemson, Clemson University Press 2020. He organized, as many of you will know, he organized the 30th Annual International Conference on Virginia Woolf in June of 2021. Um, he's the current president of the International Virginia Woolf Society and serves on the executive committee of the D.H. Lawrence Society of North America. Recent publications include Sensibility, Parochiality, Spirituality, Toward a Critical Method and Ethic of Response in Wolf, Spivak, and Mahmoud from Paul Grave, uh, Paul Grave 2019, Religious Eroticism and Pedagogy in Olive Moore's Celestial Seraglio, A Tale of Convent Life in the Modernist Review 2020, and No Children, Only Tasks, Reflections on Cruel Pedagogies, uh, which is published in Modernism and Modernity Print Plus 2021, and Relational and Reparative Pedagogies, an interview with Benjamin Hagen um, in Europe Now 2021. He is currently conducting research for a second book uh, titled Finding, tentatively titled, Finding Love in Literary Criticism and Theory. That's his working title for his book. And as you will know, his talk today is titled Finding Love in Literary Studies. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Hagen. If you'll bear with me for a second while I Yes, okay. I'm sort of an old pro at this, but I'm oddly nervous with so many people watching me do it. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, we're all still learning to navigate what it means to work and live at a university during a pandemic. So I appreciate the risks and the precautions um, you're taking today to attend this talk. 
My thanks also to those watching the recording of this presentation. I hope you feel free to participate as much or as little as you'd like. I have a publicly listed email address and welcome all comments and critical feedback that anybody may want to share, whether later this week, this month, this year, um, or whenever you can get to it, really. Thanks are lastly due to Dr. Darlene Faraby for inviting me to join the Fall 2021 Colloquium Series and to introduce you this afternoon to my research project. Before I begin, I encourage you to use your phone or tablet or laptop or to go to the following website. That's the letter B, davidhagen.com. That uh, will direct you to my blog. Um, and the first and most recent post on that blog is a, it, you'll, you'll find links where you can download a handout for this talk. You can also download the PowerPoint as well as, as, well as the transcript I'll be reading from if you'd like an accessibility copy. Um, <clears throat> The handout has all kinds of goodies on it. It's not just quotation. I mean, it's mostly quotations, but they're good ones, I promise. Um, and if you don't have a device where you can, or, where you can access the internet easily, um, most of the main block quotes that I'll be discussing today will be on PowerPoint slides, but, um, but I thought it'd be useful to have them closer to you uh, and not just uh, on the screen. Today's lecture is not an excerpt from my next book or the draft of a chapter, I'm still too early in the research and writing process for that. So in lieu of a presentable or partial chapter draft, I offer instead a model of how I read, a sense of how I conceptualize my research topic, and an elaboration of the four problems I'm currently investigating. After a dedication and an epigraph, I'll begin the main body of the talk, which will first address what I call the conceptual function that love plays in literature and literary studies, then demonstrate uh, love's slidiness, as a good friend of mine might put it. I'll explain what I mean by that, or technically what she means, and I'm just stealing um, this very technical term. Uh, and finally, elaborate for love problems that recur across a number of fields in and adjacent to literary studies. I usually don't do this, but... Um, I feel it's important to at this time, <clears throat> so bear with me. Uh, I wanna dedicate my presentation um, and really all the time and energy um, that I put into my next book to my dad. Um, he died this past June um, and I'm still reeling from this loss uh, and still dealing with it, um, but I'm learning to say thank you to him most days uh, for his kindness, his care, and his pride in Chris and April, my brother and sister, and in me. Um, we are lucky to have been his children. So I will try to tra transition from that to something else that makes me cry sometimes. Um, um, these sentences from Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick's 1993 essay collection, Tendencies, have been an encouragement and a foundation for my research and teaching for a long time. Uh, so they, excuse me, seem like an appropriate epigraph. And I'll read it to you. I think that for many of us in childhood, the ability to attach intently to a few cultural objects, objects of high or popular culture or both, cultures are objects whose meaning seemed mysterious, excessive, or oblique in relation to the codes most readily available to us became a prime resource for survival. We needed for there to be sites where the meanings didn't line up tidily with each other, and we learned to invest those sites with fascination and love. This can't help coloring the adult relation to cultural texts and objects. In fact, it's almost hard for me to imagine another way of coming to care enough about literature to give a lifetime to it. Part one, love's conceptual function. It's still hard to believe that my book on Wolf and Lawrence is over a year behind me. It's been almost two years, in fact, since I submitted the full manuscript to Clemson University Press. After three years of start and stop research in Rhode Island, after I finished my PhD in 2012, and four more years of intense research and writing in South Dakota after joining the English faculty here at USD, I feel the double awkwardness of leaving a major preoccupation behind me 
to begin a next thing. Something new, yet not all that new. As I'll explain at the beginning of part two, a triple awkwardness, perhaps, since the focus of my next book may make some people blush, cringe, roll their eyes, like this iconography might make you roll your eyes, um, sigh, tilt their head, tune out, or forget to breathe. Unlike the sensuous pedagogies of Virginia Woolf and D.H. Lawrence, my current research is not dedicated to any single author or set of authors, but to an emotion, relation, force, form, situation, or experience that we sometimes call love. Though what we talk about when we talk about love often goes by other names, intimacy, ardor, passion, heartbreak, kinship, among other words. More specifically, I'm interested in studying what I call love's conceptual function in literature and in the field of literary studies, the kind of thinking that is, that love helps along in novels and poems, but also in works of criticism, theory, philosophy, and history. I see the clumsy, potentially unattractive phrase, conceptual function, um, or I use this, this phrase in order to mark a difference between the kind of analysis I am pursuing and what we might otherwise call a study of literary thematics. What do I mean by the difference between literary thematic or literary theme and conceptual function? Let's look at an example. Derek Walcott's 1976 poem, Love After Love. Apologize if you can't read it from, from the back, but I will read it to you so you can just listen. The time will come when with elation, you will greet yourself arriving at your own door in your own mirror, and each will smile at the other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to itself to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another, who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes, peel your own image from the mirror, sit, feast on your life. I'm gonna talk about this poem for a little while, if that's okay. If a theme is something like a lesson or observation about life, human beings, or society that drives a plot or gives purpose to a poem or song, something like love conquers all, to borrow a cliche, then we could say that the theme of Walcott's poem, which connects its situation to some sort of general or relatable concern, boils down to something like self-care in the aftermath of a breakup, or getting even more general, the value of self-love, its capacity to counteract or comfort the suffering that comes with loss. There's certainly enough evidence to write a passable introduction to literature essay in support of a theme like this. In fact, I'd be happy to read such an essay. But there's also more to see, more to say, more to worry about, and more to ask here. What does the appeal to love in Walcott's widely anthologized poem accomplish? What does it do? These questions encourage a close reading of the poem that attends to the odds and ends, the component parts imminent to the speaker's invocation of love. I, do, I want to suggest some of, some of the things that Walcott uses love to think about, all the while thinking about love too. First, love and time. The poem's temporality is utterly strange. The speaker imagines a future that may indeed have arrived by the final line, a line which repeats what the speaker envisions the auditor's double, yourself in your own mirror, will say. The after in the title also implies a before that may also be the present occasion of the speaker's vision. The references to love letters, photographs and notes, synecdoches of your life, parts standing in, for a whole, may refer to other loves before the love about to be lost, the love about to be supplanted by the returning love of the stranger who was and is and will be yourself. Second, 
Though the poem is short and seems to have a narrow relational focus, it hosts a number of relationships. The relationship between, for instance, the speaker and, and the auditor, you. I'm not saying Walcott is the speaker, but just there wasn't an I to highlight, so he gets highlighted. Between you and another, between you and yourself, and interestingly, there, in the second instance of yourself, there's a space introduced between the pronoun and the self, the stranger found in the mirror. Between you and your life, between you and the items on the bookshelf, itself recalling perhaps a web of other relations, between you and your heart, which also seems to enter into relation with itself, heart to heart. These relationships aren't necessarily distinct. Some bleed into each other, they have blurred edges. It's possible also to read the poem's use of you, after all, as an instance of self-address, as an I, an I that is in a way a third you, or even the future yourself waiting to greet the you when they step through their own door. There's also a question we might ask about our own involvement in, our place in the relational matrix of the poem, how the invocation of love activates our own befores and afters, our own door and mirror, our own notes and letters and bookshelves, our own heart. Walcott's is a poem that may prompt us to wonder about the closeness of close reading, the possible form of love we can engage in when involved in reading poetry carefully. Third and last, what will you be eating? Is the feasting the speaker imagines or invites a kind of surveying, a reflecting, a reading of the items on the bookshelf? Is feasting on life a metaphor for recollection? And if so, what do we make of the oxymoronic blend of consumption and reminiscence, destruction and nourishment, self-love and self-digestion or self-mastication? The invitation in the poem is incredibly gentle, and yet there's something a bit unsettling about it. Though not the scenario Walcott had in mind, I imagine, Dad's death did occasion the kind of photographic feast with which the poem closes, hours spent looking through old albums and prints, the selection of photos for bulletin boards to be displayed at his funeral, the conversations and questions about dad's life and our family's life with mom, my sister, my brother, and others. The re recollection of this recent experience tempts me, tempts me to wind back through the poem with a very different sense of love and loss in mind a bleaker sense of before and after, but also a rene renewed hope that the theme of self-care might just be true, that feasting on my life or dad's or ours might occasion self-healing if I just read the poem one more time. I hope you can see a little bit of what I mean by love's conceptual function, how it acts as an aid to Walcott's thinking. Love is at once what the poem is about, obviously, but also a capacious imaginative space for cutting across times, for holding out an ambivalent hope for comfort and nourishment, for arranging complex relational and recursive geometries, for holding together pleasure and pain, for positing a kind of coherence in the face of imminent or actual loss, even if that coherence is a myth or a fiction. I hope you will also understand a bit of what I mean since I've been talking for a long time about this one poem when I say that my book will not be in the business of thematics. Part two, love's slidiness. 12 years ago when I was reading, uh, when I was reading D.H. Lawrence's The Rainbow for the second time as part of my prep for an upcoming PhD comprehensive exam, it occurred to me that I could and that I really wanted to write a chapter, a dissertation chapter about love. Most surprisingly, I wanted to write it about Lawrence's fiction. And I say surprisingly, because as an undergraduate, I found his novels, especially this novel, boring and utterly unbearable. The excitement that accompanied this realization is comic in hindsight, since I had no idea what I would analyze or argue, hypothesize or conclude, no idea how hard it is to write about something as ubiquitous yet mysterious as love. But nonetheless, the insight was like the book I'm trying to write over a decade later, 
not interested in establishing what we might call an ontology or a definition of love, what love really is, but drawn instead to what Lawrence's novel does with love, to what its attention to and repeated invocation of this emotion and the relations it manages to corral across three generations of family life accomplishes conceptually. I wanted to learn how love has helped along this writer's thinking. One drawback to this approach to finding love is the potential frustration that my interlocutors or my very generous audience may feel should they be looking to me for conceptual clarity or for a normative position about how we ought to love or what love is at its best. As a peer reviewer of my work recently wrote, love is, quote, a daunting topic that presents numerous pitfalls for the critic, end quote. I feel like they were warning me about something. Though it is one of the most repeated recognizable themes or tropes in the stories and other media we consume and produce, part of its persistent allure seems to be the way it can mark or signal or indicate or relate value. What matters to us, preoccupies us, sustains us, what hurts us most when lost, separated, um, um, altered or changed. Perhaps more than any other emotion, if love is an emotion, when we try to frame or focus on love, we seem to get ourselves into the study of a paradox, something both transparent and mysterious, mundane and valuably rare. We see this problem recur in different ways in the work of philosophers when they rhetorically situate their own interventions in the history of philosophies or theories of love. Irving Singer, classically, for instance, sets up a distinction between idealist and realist conceptions of love, while more recently, Carrie Jenkins tries to square the circle of love as a social construct and as a biological fact of human being or evolution. These distinctions, idealist, realist, social, biological, might not at first blush, blush seem related to each other, but they do convey a disciplinary will to define or determine that feels quite alien to me. I say disciplinary to mark a potential difference between a literary study of love and a philosophical one, a difference that could very well encompass different attitudes, methods, purposes, goals, and relationships to words, feelings, histories, and sociocultural contingencies. The background here, this is very subtext, is, is the part of the, the Penguin cover to Plato's Republic, um, which where Plato famously in his thought experiment um, kicks the poets out of, out of the Republic, so. I, I, I just liked the image, but it felt, felt fitting for the paragraph too. Some studies of love approach love's habit, or I should say our habit of sliding back and forth between the poles of the dualisms I've in inventoried, idealist, realist, social, biological, as a problem in need of solution or a circle in need of squaring, as I've already said. Whether the motive to define love as epistemological, ontological, or even political, as we will see later on, my habits of thought are, for better or worse, too bound up with relativism to take up, to, to take up such pursuits for myself. I don't try to avoid, don't want to avoid, but to accept and affirm what a friend of mine calls the slidiness of love. Whatever love is, it is nothing if not situationally variable and relative, even if we're working within a realist or biological register. Instead of um, trying to decide whether we should be an idealist or a realist or both when it comes to love or think of it as a social construct or a biological fact or both, it seems to me that the literary itself, whatever that is, refuses to decide. More than that, one kind of conceptual work that appeals to love make possible is the very bringing together of mutually exclusive categories. Claiming a structural similarity between love and the work of metaphor, Anne Carson describes, quote, a change or shift of distance in the mind that brings two heterogeneous things close in order to reveal their kinship, to hold an equipoise, two perspectives at once. Fittingly, she's talking at once about love and metaphor. Even Lawrence, who is often taken to be something of an exasperating idealist, a priest of love, as biographer Harry T. R. Harry T. Moore puts it, is drawn to love as if it were an access point both to metaphysical speculation and to the concrete and often comic mechanics of human behavior. So, sorry about this, but let's take a look at two passages from Lawrence's The Rainbow. 
For context, these passages are set the day after a wedding and situate us in the bedroom of the newlyweds. So brace yourself. I'm kind of half kidding, but so here, here's Lawrence. Inside the room was a great steadiness, a core of living eternity. Only far outside at the rim went on the noise and the distraction. Here at the center, the great wheel was motionless, centered upon itself. Here was a poised, unflawed stillness that was beyond time because it remained the same, inexhaustible, unchanging, unexhausted. Keeps going. As they lay close together, complete and beyond the touch of time or change, it was as if they were at the very center of all the slow wheeling of space and the rapid agitation of life deep, deep inside them all, at the center where there is utter radiance and eternal being and the silence absorbed in praise. This thing keeps going. The steady core of all movements, the unawakened sleep of all wakefulness. At least we have a period. They found themselves there and they lay still in each other's arms for their moment. For their moment, they were at the heart of eternity while its time roared far off, forever far off towards the rim. The passage clearly and a bit annoyingly, though to me somewhat deliciously, indulges in a sort of amplified universalistic metaphysical sense of intimacy, marriage, and love. We may also imagine a savvy literary critic asking what kind of social norms or ideologies this description supports yet obscures, what kind of social construct it participates in naturalizing as a true or inevitable picture of love or human relationship. But then, just half a page later, the real and biological interrupt this idealistic amplification of the morning after. Then, quite calmly, even a little surprised, she was in the present and saying, I am dying of hunger or with hunger. So am I, he said calmly, as if it were not of not the slightest important significance. And they relapsed into the warm golden stillness and the minutes flowed unheeded past the window outside. Then suddenly she stirred against him. My dear, I am dying of hunger, she said. It was a slight pain to him to be brought to, We'll get up, he said, unmoving. And she sank her head onto him again, and they lay still, lapsing. Half consciously, he heard the clock chime the hour. She did not hear. Do get up, she murmured at length, and give me something to eat. Yes, he said. And he put his arms round her, and she lay with her face on him. They were faintly astonished that they did not move. The minutes rustled louder at the window. Let me go then, he said. She lifted her head from him relinquishingly. With a little breaking away, he moved out of bed and was taking his clothes. She, she stretched out her hand to him. You are so nice, she said. And he went back for a moment or two. In the interest of time, I won't develop a close reading of these passages um, in the same way I did with Walcott. All I will say is that the literary as a process or quality of what Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak calls the singular and unverifiable has a tendency to betray stable definitions of the is and normative claims about the ought. They also do sneaky things to us like doing something half a page later that we're really sure they're up to in one passage that we've quoted. Thus Lawrence's representations of love tend to slide back and forth between the ideal and real, the social and the corporeal, the serious and the common. Two last things before we move on to the final portion of this lecture. Um, first, my relativism and my embrace of love's conceptual slidiness are also motivated by its relational, emotional and ethical capaciousness that breaks us out of the dualistic swings I've been describing. The love that literature and literary studies have been talking around and about for a long time touches, sustains, and disrupts a range of relations, not just romantic ones, that inflect, shape, pressure, and slide into and next to each other. The love between romantic partners is no more loving, it seems to me, than the love between parents and children, readers and books, pets and pet owners, siblings, cousins, strangers, friends, dreamers, and dreams 
we're thinking back to Walcott, you and yourself. This relativistic sense of love's slidiness also acknowledges that this emotion, again, if it is an emotion, combines with and amplifies or softens a range of other affects, from anger and joy to hatred, shame, interest, disgust, competitiveness, generosity, cruelty, and more. It can also motivate a range of ethical, ethically indifferent, and ethically compromised behaviors, causes, or beliefs. In short, then, love's slidiness is not just about the oscillation between the categories I've been talking about, but also a more multiplicitous roving among many relations that enter into combination with many other emotions, and that entail varied ethical and unethical orientations. Second, this one's shorter, don't worry. If you want definitions, you'll find lots of them on the handout I noted at the beginning of the talk. So there's the website again, if you didn't download it yet. Um, and so if what you want are definitions, there are lots of them there. Um, and I encourage you to scroll through and skim through them to see resonances among some of them, but also the stark incommensurability among others. And if you see definitions you'd like to talk more about, you know who to email. Part three, love problems. My lecture thus far has really been an introduction to how I think about love and not really a description of what my next book will cover. And so in this final section, I'd like to turn to the specific problems I've been studying. My project follows a method that I like to call reading crosswise or reading promiscuously. Though I have my own habits of study and aesthetic and critical preferences, finding love tries to learn from a wide range of texts across traditional literary periods and across theoretical paradigms, drawing on modernist studies, which is my home field, but also Victorian studies, early modern studies, studies in contemporary literature, feminism, psychoanalysis, formalism, black studies, queer studies, philosophy of emotion, post-critique, metaphysics, political philosophy, aesthetics, poetics, Pauline theology, something called auto theory, and more. This isn't really a brag. It's just like this to talk about love and to do what I want to do. I, I can't just kind of hunker down in my own um, wheelhouse. I have to learn from others. This method of study isn't quite what Tressie McMillan caught a means when she posits that you have to sleep around before you marry an argument. But I appreciate her association of research with a reading around, an association we also find in Melissa Sanchez's recent study of queer faith and early modern literature and theology. In her coda to that study, she writes, quote, I don't think I have a slide for this. Having initially been so doubtful myself, it is odd to be in the position of trying to persuade readers from a range of fields, queer theorists, critical race scholars, early modern critics and theologians, that my promiscuous readings across time and tradition might be productive or pleasurable, end quote. In its own promiscuous readings across time and tradition, Finding Love, the book I'm trying to write, will try to articulate four problems that repeat their difference across disciplinary and historical boundaries. These problems are, and these, as Gayatri Spivak, plain prose cheats. So they're just two words long, but they are, they are more, I'll be elaborating what I mean by them in just a second. So love's greatness, love's prepositions, yes, prepositions, love's genres, and love's politics. In focusing on these problems, I suggest that one way to understand love's order of constancy, to invoke a phrase of Hortense Spillers, which she takes from Gwendolyn Brooks, um, it, it's not, an, uh, excuse me, one way to understand love's order of constancy is not through the isolation or definition of its inherent characteristics, but rather through careful attention to the consistent difficulties and promises that keep coming up around love in different times and traditions. So problem one, love's greatness. First Corinthians 13, probably didn't think I was going there, but first Corinthians 13 famously concludes by listing three major aspects of Christian life and Pauline theology, faith, hope, and love that will carry on after all else has passed away. Moreover, it pronounces love the greatest of these. The opening verses of the chapter give some indication of why the Apostle Paul names love the greatest. 
if the translation looks weird, it's the, um, the translation is called the New American Standard Bible. So if you want to, you know, get into the weeds and quibble about why this translation, I'm game for that too. So verse one, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. These verses imagine three parallel, impossible human beings who respectively have mastered earthly and divine tongues, have the profoundest faith in God's power, accessing that which God only knows, and have crafted the most selfless of lives. Without love, though, the first one says nothing, the second becomes nothing, the third earns nothing. Meaninglessness, falseness, empty-handedness, the consequences of lovelessness. Though the apostle has a specific kind of love in mind here, the Greek word, as many of you probably know, is agape, not eros or philia. This formulation of love as a kind of super additive, as the greatest of these, characterizes a wide field of modern literary and cultural theory, which leverages love to give consistency to thoughts, feelings, methods, and our purposes, looking to it, whether rhetorically, pragmatically, or wishfully, to recalibrate lives, tie up loose ends, stabilize imbalanced or precarious conditions, soothe uncertainties, guarantee futures, focus straying attentions, catalyze compounds of theory and practice, or reassemble scattered fragments. Against strange maladies, a sovereign cure, as Shakespeare puts it in Sonnet 153, with its dateless, lively heat, that's also Shakespeare, love promises to hold us, or something, anything, sometimes everything, together. So going in the weeds, I'm interested, for instance, in the fact that Michael Hart and, and, and Antonio Negri, who shook up the field uh, of many fields in humanities, actually, with their book Empire about 20 years ago, turned to love in their book Commonwealth, published nine years later, claiming that this emotion, love, is the missing element that will bind together the multitude of the poor with the exodus from capitalist command and pull all that they have been proposing for 10 years into, into a coherent project. For these two philosophers, love, understood as, quote, a process of the production of the common and the production of subjectivity, end quote, builds a bridge between theory or prophecy um, and the world after capitalism, a bridge between theory and the on the ground politics of a quote, new social body, the multitude that will bring this revolution about. We could also look to psychoanalytic theory, Skip. Don't worry, I'm not gonna pick on it. I quite, quite admire it where love sits often silently at the heart of the Oedipal drama that drives it. Indeed, though love rarely makes it into the lexicon of psychoanalytic jargon that students pick up in their classes on literary theory, it is ever present. It's not far away from the id, ego, or superego, or libidinal economy, or repression and sublimation, or the fetish, or even the phallic mother, whatever that is, or the symbolic order, or manifest and latent content. It's also central, not just to theory, to psychoanalytic theory. Reading Freud, Lacan, or Melanie Klein on psychotherapy, we see that the transference love that is supposed to occur between a therapist and an analysand is meant to carry on the signifying chain of a demand for love that first emerges in the Oedipal scene. Indeed, as for Hart and Negri, and as for Paul, Love is structurally fundamental to psychoanalysis, and the consequences of its absence would be devastating, both for theory and practice. The cycle of the Oedipal drama would break down, none of us would ever enter into the symbolic order, meaning we would never learn to speak, 
and the psycho and psychotherapy would never do the work as Bruce Bruce thinks Bruce think thinks uh, of quote disrupting the repetition of the Oedipal scene, making something new possible here that had previously been just a repetition of the same old story. End quote. For a literary example, I want to share a rough sketch I made early um, in the lockdown in April 2020, not like a drawing, don't worry, a conceptual map, yay, uh, a map of love in Marcel Proust's Swan in Love, uh, a novella tucked near the beginning of his very long novel, In Search of Lost Time. Though Proust's treatment of love in general is often boiled down to a process of jealousy and suffering that finds its retroactive apotheosis in a work of art created long after the failure of many relationships. This map, which I won't drive you through, suggests a more interesting Proust, someone who offers a much more nuanced, massive anatomy of what love supports, transforms, but also threatens in any given life. Without love, much more than Swan's romance would collapse. Problem number two. Now the really interesting stuff. When I say prepositions, I literally mean words that anchor phrases like to the store, behind this podium, around and adjacent to literary studies. As odd as this focus may seem, it might not seem like a problem at all. During the very first grad course I led here at USD, my class and I noticed that some writers tend to privilege specific prepositions when writing about love or intimacy. Each preposition or combination of prepositions suggests distinct connotations as well as a different spatial arrangement according to which, say, characters in a novel or, you know, whatever, live and conceptualize love relations. The philosopher Robert Solomon insists, for instance, that we love with one another, the with connoting the formation of what he calls shared identity or shared subjectivity, and his insistence on equality at the heart of romantic love. For the feminist theorist Luce Arigaray, the prep proper preposition is to or at. She rewrites the declaration, I love you, je t'aime in French, as I love to you, j'aime à toi. The difference here may seem slight, but a knowledge of English and French basic mechanics, right? You don't actually have to think long about this, um, helps us observe that the, the, the shift of the you from the position of direct object to the position of indirect object. The preposition to or at marks this indirection also inserting a visible distance between the I and the U, especially in French. As Arigarai puts it in her study, I love to you, sketch of a possible felicity in history, the at or the to, or in French, the a, that introduces indirection into the love declaration, transforms this declaration into an ethical act of recognition that eschews mastery or possession of others. This is Arigarai, quote, I recognize you signifies that you are different from me, that I cannot identify myself with nor master your becoming. I will never be your master. And it's this negative that enables me to go towards you." End quote. In The Lonely Letters, Ashen Crawley marvels at the way prepositions proliferate in Black studies and among Black people, specifically regarding matters of love, joy, music, and worship. He, or his persona, the capital letter A, shares a dream of, quote, teaching a song to a choir and the experience of getting lost in the voices, vibrating to and in and with the music, end quote. Later in the same letter, he explains that this dream, quote, felt irredu irreducibly social, like being back in, in the church with others, like a love, a relationship, a friendship, end quote. To, with, in, elsewhere, I won't show you the whole passages, on, of, from, for, with, and in, with, on, and along. Each combination poses a distinct prepositional problem, as he puts it that doubles as prepositional capaciousness. Intimacy is such, he writes, that it resists easy analytics." End quote. Let's look at Lucille Clifton's 1993 poem, Daughters. Quote, woman who shines at the head of my grandmother's bed, brilliant woman, 
I like to think you whispered into her ear instructions. I like to think you are the oddness in us. You are the arrow that pierced our plain skin and made us fancy women. My wild witch gran, my magic mama, and even these gaudy girls. I like to think you gave us extraordinary power and to protect us, you became the name we were cautioned to forget. It is enough, you must have murmured, to remember that I was and that you are. Woman, I am Lucille, which stands for light, daughter of Thelma, daughter of Georgia, daughter of dazzling you. In place of a close reading, I only ask the poem, what we learn of the love, the intergenerational relations, the creative work of kinship imagined by this poem when we pay attention to the careful arrangement of prepositions at the head of my grandmother's bed, into her ear, in us, daughter of, daughter of, daughter of. Part three loves genres. In his 2011 PMLA article, Can We Read the Book of Love? Richard Turdeman claims that the quote, ineffability of love is impermanent its silence engenders narrative, end quote. Martha Nussbaum elaborates Turdeman's claim 20 years earlier when Proust's using Proust's enormous novel as her main example. She considers um, the kind of text that properly shows the link between love and knowledge, a text that displays, quote, a temporal sequence of events that has a plot that can represent the complexities of a concrete human relationship that can show both denial and yielding that gives no definitions and allows the mysterious to remain so, end quote. In short, for Nussbaum, the genre proper to love's knowledge would be the novel or narrative more generally. Better yet, of course, would be a text that could mix the emotional and experiential affordances of stories with what she calls the probing and questioning of philosophy, which when properly and patiently applied, she continues, can show the most tender and protective care for our experiences of love and our love stories, end quote. But does love need the structure of stories? Need it be a story? Is it the case that novels or short stories are more proper for the expression or education, expression of or education in love's complexity? Is it the case that some admixture of duration and patient philosophical refl reflection are best suited to these tasks? What of poetry? What about love do poems express? What do they afford us readers? If not, as Nussbaum puts it, knowledge. How does the style or the craft of fictions and poems, but also critical and theoretical and philosophical writing come to influence, inform, obstruct, or perform ideas of love, attachment, intimacy, fidelity, ardor, or suffering. Though Clifton may not elaborate on the intergenerational love or the history of intimacy and kinship that is imagined in Daughters to the extent, say, that Proust slowly anatomizes down to the cellular brain, the emotional theatrics of jealousy, she has at her disposal plenty of tools that are usually unavailable to the novel writer or novel reader breaks at line or stanza, although there are no stanzas here, engendment, saturation, line integrity, manipulation of white space, a concentrated implication of obscurity and particularity that we might call singularity and more. These were the tools that were also available to Walcott in Love After Love, a poem also quite capable, as I hope I demonstrated several minutes ago, probably feels like an hour ago now, of the sort of knowledge that Nussbaum circumscribes almost wholly within the domain of narrative fiction. Indeed, I take the recent provocations of James Kuzner in The Form of Love, Poetry's Quarrel with Philosophy, published just a few weeks ago, as a crucial counterpoint to Nussbaum and Turdeman, and a valuable resource for working through my questions about the affordances of distinct genres and styles, and the sort of knowledges, aspects, or experiences of love we encounter in our study of literature. Last section, I promise, love's politics. 
In The Politics of Friendship, Jacques Derrida spends a few pages worrying over a passage from Frederick Nietzsche's The Gay Science that posits friendship as, quote, a love more loving than love, end quote. More loving, as Derrida reasons, friendship does not want to possess and denounces the right to property. After his concluding summary of Nietzsche's argument that the just name of love would be friendship, Derrida wonders, perhaps one day, here or there, who knows, something may happen between two people in love who would love each other lovingly. Is this still the right word? In such a way that friendship just once, perhaps, for the first time, another perhaps, once and only once, therefore, for the first and last time, perhaps, perhaps, will become the correct name, the right and just name for that which would then have taken place, the condition being that it take place between two. Even if the right name for this unique love were to be found, how would you convince everyone else of its appropriateness? And yes, all those parentheses are Derrida, not me. That's not my commentary. Apologies for drawing Derrida in in the closing minutes of this lecture, but the performative hand wringing we read and maybe enjoy in this passage speaks to the final problem I want to investigate in finding love, namely that what we talk about when we talk about love is often deeply unjust, violent, possessive, and unfriendly. Raymond Carver's short story, which I've been invoking several times throughout this lecture, also seems to be a study in this kind of love knowledge. And whether Proust intends it or not, the long reflections on suffering that takes up so much of In Search of Lost Time and Not Just One in Love also confirms this insight. Though the 50 years since Shulamith Firestone's dialectic of sex has seen many, many efforts to forget her insights into the quote, political significance of love and love in its destructive guise, end quote, her provocations remain compelling and I think they're incredibly important. Indeed, her work works against Derrida's musings, though he of course comes around to working against himself too, as he normally does, about the becoming friendship or the becoming just of love. Writing that women who are self-emancipated from economic dependence on men usually come to find out, as she claims, quote, that the honesty, generosity, and camaraderie of men is a lie. Men are all too glad, she writes, to use friends, and it's a little unclear if she means specifically women who befriend them or if it also entails their male friends, I assume both, um, that men are all too happy to use them and sell them out, end quote. Indeed, in reading Firestone's analysis of modern love, it's initially difficult not to accept her conclusion, given the class inequities love entails, the futures it, it often forecloses, and the idealizations it seems to require. Who needs it, she says. I don't think she's really asking, it's an argument. If we take a look at uh, Proust's monofocalized account of Swann's love affair with Odette de Crecy, we can get a full and I think even fuller demonstration of Firestone's account of what love often quote means to men. It means ownership and control. It means jealousy where he never exhibited it before. It means a growing lack of interest uh, coupled with a roving eye. And this is the passage that ends with the question which is really an argument or a conclusion, who needs it, end quote. Indeed, over, uh, the, over the course of many, many pages, Swan, who is prefiguring the narrator's own affairs with Gilbert and Albertine later in In Search of Lost Time, develops a whole repertoire of jealous strategies, pleasures, invented mysteries, suspicions, and problems of truth in his affair with her. Swan links Odette as a figure and fabrication with various artifacts and works of art that come to symbolize her and their love. And there's more, invented routines, events that become idealized memories, places that become sacred spaces, and more. The whole mechanism, as my students were quick to pick up on last spring in our study of this text, is deeply toxic. Even if there is maybe something to learn here, something interesting even about amorous figures, routines, jealousies, and invented pleasures of our own. One avenue for asking different, more affirmative questions about love and politics would be to return to Clifton's poem within the framework of Black feminist theory and politics. And I'll close with these reflections. 
In Black Feminism Reimagined After Intersectionality, Jennifer C. Nash rehearses the centrality of love in Black feminist theory and politics, citing Alice Walker's definition of womanism, the quote, love for ourselves, end quote, written into the statement of the Kambahi River Collective, Tiffany Lithobo King's quote, critical call for loving engagement with intersectionality, end quote, June Jordan's poetry, and Christina Sharp's study of what Sharp calls wake work, which builds, as Nash summarizes, quote, on the long Black feminist engagement with survival as a radical form of politics, a tradition that emphasizes Black creativity, Black thriving, and Black life in the midst of overwhelming violence, end quote. Within this rich framework that Nash builds, which I'm barely scratching the surface of here, she posits a love politics predicated on vulnerability and witnessing. She describes it this way. If vulnerability is a recognition, let me move that, that we are undone by each other and an invitation to embrace rather than retreat from that fact, it is also a testament to how we are witnesses to moments when we are subjected to violence particularly by social structures that have been constructed to discipline and surveil. Black feminism has positioned and imagined Black women as outsiders within, who have a particular vantage point on how structures of domination operate to marginalize, constrain, and injure certain bodies. Black women are then witnesses who can see and even name forms of violence that other subjects cannot see or simply refuse to see. What's love got to do with this? Clifton po Clifton's poem, Daughters, which I'll have you, I won't read it, I'll have you read one more time to close this lecture, not out loud, don't worry, uh, can help us see what makes this kind of politics a love politics. It's because Clifton shows us uh, a structure of vulnerability and witnessing, not just in the present, but across generations of Black women. The poem speaks a deep awareness of vulnerability, a link between that vulnerability and what Clifton calls powers that may in fact be powers directed toward witnessing, even as they are also directed toward the protection and the love of kin. With all due respect to Derrida, it seems to me that love's just name would not be friendship, but at least in the US across its history, black feminist collective. Think of Audre Lorde, for whom the erotic is, quote, an assertion of the life force of women, of that creative energy empowered, the knowledge and use of which we are now reclaiming in our language, our history, our dancing, our loving, our work, our lives, end quote. So one more time, one last time, Clifton's daughters. Can you feel the love? Thank you. But I see I've run right up to five, which I was worried about, but. So many things to keep track of. I can't, okay, which ones do I? Right. Yeah, I mean, I'm, that's still something I'm kind of working out, but um, my grad students and I were actually talking about this a couple weeks ago um, in, in relationship to gender trouble and Judith Butler's commentary on Lacan. And it seems to me that at least for Lacan, I'm not, I won't speak for Freud or others, there is a, an important difference between desire, which seems to be this sort of process of, um, of forces going sort of subterranean, right? It's more tied to, to um, what happens with the unconscious after, sorry, everybody, after the father says, no, you can't, right? 
she's mine, but good news, you can have your own, right? You know what I mean? You see what I'm going with that? And so desire is sort of the mechanism that kicks in to handle that, the repression of that, no, right? Um, and it's that drama that sort of unplays from there, plays out from there. But for Lacan, love, love seems very different. It seems tied to um, both, the, both the moment in which someone enters into the symbolic order to make the demand for love and that the, the no is a response to that demand, right? And so love is tied then to the use of language and the effort to, to sort of give name, not to desire, but to need. And need seems to be this sort of like pre-symbolic, right? Um, energy or urge. And so in a weird way, and again, sorry, this is the weeds, everybody, I'm sorry. But in, in Lacanian psychoanalysis, love seems to be this mediating term between what Lacan wants to call need and desire. If that makes sense. So it might not make sense, but I'm, I'm still working through how to differentiate those things. But it is interesting that when they talk about transference, they almost always associate it with love or something translated as love, not always translated as desire. So that's, that's interesting to me. I was prepared for the psychoanalysis question. <laughs> Probably not. Go ahead. Sure. And then, like, the conceptual or aesthetic does, like, do you? Yeah. I mean, the, the quick answer is, yeah, yes, I'm interested in that relationship. Um, but as someone who, like, I guess the investigations I ru I'm running, though, aren't historical in the sense that I'm not necessarily attempting to always link up the texts I'm reading um, to um, particular historical moments. Though it's possible I'm kind of playing fast and loose a little bit because in engaging, say, with the discourse of love and politics and black feminism, that is a deeply historicized idea of love. Um, and so I think, I think to some degree, I wanna remain sensitive to the historical difference, but still acknowledge that despite historical differences, one thing I, I seem to be picking up on is that even as the, the shapes and forms of love or the purposes of love change, um, there is oddly sort of difficulties and problems that seem to still come up, you know, in those discourses. So that though Paul is not imagining romance when he's writing 1 Corinthians 13, the, insisting on the, the insistence on the greatness of this thing has nevertheless sort of, sort of become a kind of trope in a lot of theorization. And that's what I'm interested in, that love seems to have an incredible rhetorical allure, whether people are talking romantically or whether they're talking politically or what, you know, and yet there is this sort of common word that has many definitions because it describes many different kinds of relational matrices or matrices, but, um, but the difference still seems to kind of recur across those, across those texts and times. Does that make sense? I hope I'm kind of answering it. What's that? Yeah. Absolutely not. No, I don't think so. Um, I don't think it matters. Um, and that's kind of what I was getting at with my, with my problematic invocation of relativism, that 
that love is often not romantic, we tend to often associate it in pop culture with, with romance, but it is nevertheless invoked often um, to make sense of or to think about human relationships. Um, and so I think, I think that sort of very bare thread that can connect up those things, I think warrants a putting, a, a putting you know, Paul next to Hart and Negri who directly invoke him next to psychoanalysis, next to D.H. Lawrence, so. Thanks everybody. And thanks everybody who watched the whole thing. <laughs>